This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Good evening and welcome. My name is Nigella Hilgarth, and I'm the executive director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. And welcome to the latest in the Perspectives on Ocean Science lecture, that is the Jeffrey B. Graham series. And it is my great pleasure to, this evening to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jeff Gee. Now, Jeff actually did his PhD here at Scripps. Um, before that, he did his uh, B.S. in geology uh, in 1984 at uh, Washington and Lee University, Lexington, Virginia. And also, he has a B.A. in German, um, which he got at the same time. So um, a very uh, bright scholar. And then he came to Scripps in 1985 to do his uh, doctorate. And then he left for a brief time and came back in 1994, I think it is. Um, and never left, which is, as it should be, the best people come back to Scripps. Uh, first of all, as a researcher and now as a professor who studies magnetism. And so without further ado, I'm going to ask Jeff to um, talk to us this evening about exploring the extremes of the Earth's magnetic field, which is a topic which absolutely fascinates me and I can't wait. Well, thank you, Nigella, and uh, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. I'm impressed to see a large crowd. I'm passionate about the magnetic field, and uh, hopefully I'll uh, get you excited to tell you a little bit about what we can learn by studying the magnetic fields. Um, and we're going to look at uh, some rocks. These are rocks down in Antarctica, so this is going to be a good part of the talk. Um, but first, I'm going to start out um, by telling you a little bit about why you might be interested in learning about the magnetic field and what kinds of information we can, uh, we can learn from that. And then um, we'll go down to Antarctica and look at these rocks, these uh, beautiful, uh, it's a little dark on the screen there, but the nice layering in these rocks. These are igneous intrusive rocks, so they were molten and, uh, and cooled very slowly underground. And they turn out to be just a wonderful place to look at uh, records of the magnetic field. And then, because this is uh, an ocean science perspective talk, I'll come back to the last little bit of the talk. We'll, uh, I'll show you another way that we can look at the magnetic field, and that's out at sea using, uh, using some new tools out there. So I wanted to, uh, to give a, a little shout out to my collaborators uh, who've worked with me down in Antarctica here, uh, some people at the uh, University of Wyoming, who are actually looking at how these rocks are put together, sort of how the, the igneous rocks are, are manufactured. And I brought some, uh, some display items over here for the question time. So, so the magnetic field is, uh, is not an easy thing to uh, visualize. Uh, this is one of the few examples that, uh, that I could think of anyway, where you can actually visualize what the, what the structure of the magnetic field looks like. This is a, a picture of the aurora uh, right near the South Pole station taken about uh, just about a year ago today. And you can see down here in the bottom is actually um, a little Scott tent. Somebody, I'm not quite sure what they're doing out, uh, outside of the South Pole um, in the sort of early, very early spring. So that's actually one indication of uh, one thing that the magnetic field does for us, and that is that it, uh, it shields us from, uh, from material that's coming in the solar wind from the sun. So this image from NASA shows the Earth here with its uh, magnetic field. We'll talk about the structure of this. It's a really simple uh, dipolar structure. But that magnetic field is influenced by the solar uh, wind and forms sort of uh, changes the shape of the magnetic field lines a little bit. And that's what's responsible for sending those uh, charged particles down into the north and uh, and south latitudes, high latitudes. 
So if the magnetic field went away, um, one of the influences would be that we would all of a sudden uh, not have this shielding anymore. So that might be one reason you uh, would be interested in learning about the field. Of course, something that, uh, that I'm sure everyone is familiar with is the, is the use of the magnetic field as a navigation tool, although we don't, we don't use this very much now that everyone has their own GPS. Uh, but, uh, but sort of the first, um, the picture here is actually a copper engraving from uh, the early 1700s. Um, this is one of, the, one of the first maps showing the green line here divides um, what's called the magnetic declination. That's an, a term that I'll use a little bit in the talk. So the magnetic declination is simply the angle that your compass needle makes with the true north of the Earth. And so this line uh, shows where that angle is zero, or was back in 1700, and uh, goes in different directions uh, to the east and west of that line. So even uh, as far back as the, as the 11th century, we have written records of people using the field to navigate. And people were quite aware that the magnetic field uh, changes uh, quite a lot in time. So let's see if this, uh, this works. So one of the, this is a, a little animation showing what that same parameter, the declination of the fields uh, does. This starts at about 1590 and then it's gonna go up to present and you can see the difference between the blue and the red there. That's that same uh, difference in east and west pointing. Um, and this, this kind of information uh, was derived, there's actually a colleague of ours uh, who's now in uh, Zurich and he spent a lot of time sort of poring over old ship's logs uh, going back to the, to the late 1500s to reconstruct what the field was doing. So for historical uh, times, we have this sort of information. And what, what makes the magnetic field so useful for navigation? Um, one of the things that makes it very useful is that it, the Earth's field has a very simple structure. Um, and that structure is as if we had a, a bar magnet sitting in the center of the Earth uh, generating this simple pattern of flux lines. That's what you get from a, from a dipole source. So the geometry is approximately uh, dipolar, sort of at the 90% level, uh, that's true. And that means that we have some really simple relationships between how the field changes with latitude. So one that we use in magnetics quite a lot is the fact that the angle that the, the magnetic flux lines make with the, the local horizon is zero, so it's parallel to the surface of the Earth at the equator, and then as you go to the poles, it gets steeper. So that's one of the ways we can tell how, for example, plates and rocks have moved around in the past. Of course, there is no bar magnet uh, down at the center of the Earth. It's, it's far too hot to, uh, to have any sort of permanent magnetism. And instead, um, the field is generated by a circulation of liquid iron in the outer core. So this lower figure here is just uh, showing this is the core. And it's the outer part, which is liquid. And then in the middle here, there's a small uh, inner core, which is actually solid iron. And it's this circulation of the liquid iron in the outer core that generates and sustains the magnetic field. And the other th reason I put this slide in here is uh, this actually also gives you an indication of why we have a strongly dipolar field. So the spinning of the Earth, the rotation of the Earth, um, and the presence of the inner core uh, set up these helical flow patterns that actually give us a field that's more or less um, oriented with the spin axis of the Earth. So the other very useful thing about the magnetic fields, uh, particularly um, in Earth sciences for us, is that the, one of the features of this kind of circulation, liquid circulation, is that they not only generate a field, but they will spontaneously uh, switch directions. And so this uh, flipping in uh, direction is something I'll call a polarity reversal. <clears throat> and we'll look at um, several records of that throughout the talk. So we know that the, that the Earth's field has changed in sign or polarity uh, lots of times in the past, and, and we'll see this uh, diagram a few times in the talk. This is, um, this is actually a four panel figure. So that goes, each one is about 40 million years, so starting at present and going back to about 160 million years. And on this plot, what we're looking at is the, the black and white sort of bar code diagram shows you when it's black, the field is oriented essentially the same direction as it is today. We call that normal polarity. 
And then where it's white, uh, we call that reverse polarity. So that's 180 degrees different from today's field. And then the other line or series of lines on here, these red lines, this is actually one of the kinds of observations that I'll talk about in the, in the second part of the talk. And these are actually the, what are called magnetic anomalies. These are small variations in the Earth's magnetic field that we typically observe out at sea. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. And this is the pattern that would be produced by this, by this barcode. So where does that sort of information come from? So how do we know that the field has switched in the past and, and when it's happened? And basically, as soon as we get older than historical records, uh, we, we can go a little bit further back by using um, archaeological materials that get us back a few thousands of years. And then before that, we have to rely on geological materials. So we can actually get nice records of the magnetic field either from the type of rock over here on the right. This is a sedimentary rock, so one that's generated by settling out of particles uh, at the ambient surface conditions, and you can see the nice, the nice layering in there. Um, or we can get records from igneous rocks that cool down from molten lava, whether they're lava that erupts at the surface and cools, or whether they cool underground, we call those uh, igneous intrusions. So that's the kind of rock that we'll be looking at today. So both of those kinds of rocks can actually give us information on the direction of the magnetic fields. They retain that record by different physical processes. So in the case of the sediments, it's the physical alignment of small magnetic particles when the sediment is deposited or, or churned up by um, animals that are living on the seafloor. And in the case of lavas and igneous rocks, that happens just simply by cooling down. The magnetic minerals are formed when the rock cools and then they get magnetized and that gets locked in at, at low temperature. So one key element that uh, the reason we're looking at some igneous rocks today is that igneous rocks are actually the only ones that we can use if we want to know what the absolute intensity of the field was in the past. And that's one of the things I'll show you that we're, uh, we've been interested in doing. So, um, Lavas that, uh, that erupt at the surface of the Earth cool down and become imprinted by the, whatever the ambient magnetic field direction is. And this has turned out to be, together with the reversals of the field, has turned out to be just an incredibly useful thing in marine sciences. And that's uh, what I want to illustrate with this cartoon. So this cartoon shows a couple of uh, ridge crests out in the, in the ocean basins. And at these spreading centers, we're creating new um, oceanic crust. And that crust is primarily made of basaltic lavas, so a type of igneous rock that comes out, cools, and of course gets magnetized. And then every time the field changes orientation, the rocks will record the new orientation. And so we wind up generating essentially a barcode uh, pattern that's spread away from, uh, from the ridge crest. And what's even nicer about that is that we can actually measure this remotely. So the, the magnetization or the magnetic signal in the rocks here actually perturbs the Earth's field just a little bit, sort of less than a percent, um, and sometimes considerably less than that. But we can measure that very easily out at sea. So if we go and we tow a magnetometer behind the ship, we can actually measure those subtle changes in the field, and we can recover the stripes that are on the seafloor. So I said this, was, this has been really useful and just almost a too successful uh, topic in, uh, in marine sciences. People are less interested now in looking at, uh, at the origin of anomalies because everything's sorted out. But uh, so one of the things we can do uh, then is we can basically uh, have ships that go around collecting that kind of um, information about anomaly, what I call anomaly variations or the magnetic uh, intensity variations at the sea surface. And you can match up where you are in that barcode. And you can tell how old the crust is. So this picture of the seafloor ages. So the black lines here are those uh, spreading ridges. And the red colors, this is younger crust getting progressively older. And we get out to something about 180 million years uh, ago or so is the oldest seafloor that we have. Of course, the uh, seafloor has been made before that, but it's all been recycled back down into the mantle. So 
So far I've uh, talked about how we can learn about the magnetic field from rocks, both igneous and sediments a little bit. Um, it turns out you can also model the origin and properties of the magnetic fields. This is a, a challenging exercise in uh, magnetohydrodynamics, um, but we now have computers that do a pretty good job of making Earth-like simulations of the magnetic field. And that's what we're looking at here is these are snapshots of what the flux lines look like in the deep Earth, so the core is, is just inside there before, during, and after a reversal. So we can actually model, um, model fields that look like the Earth and they have this property of spontaneously changing orientations. So these reversals, um, we're gonna look at some directional changes. The directions uh, from one polarity state to the other typically takes about 4,000 years or so is the best estimate. Um, but you'll notice that when the field is reversing, the structure of the field gets very complicated, and as a result, the intensity is quite low when the field is reversing. And that low intensity can actually last for a substantially longer period of time, maybe as much as 10,000 or 20,000 years. So I'm gonna sort of set up a, a question that I'll attempt to answer, uh, and that's sort of based on some of these, um, what are called dynamo models. Um, these numerical models of the field. And this, uh, this figure, we don't need to worry too much about what's going on on the left here, but I put it up there just to, to remind me that one of, the, one of the benefits of having these numerical simulations now is that we actually get some predictions that uh, are of things that we can test by going out and sampling rocks. And so that's where, that's where I get uh, interested in it. So for example, these are a series of simulations the, the one on the right here, the red dots, are where the field, where the magnetic uh, pole would appear to be at various times. And you can see this one's very concentrated in one spot. This one's a little more dispersed and even more dispersed. And those differences in the model are simply related to the origin or the, the nature of heat flow across the outer part of the core. So these are different patterns of heat flow and the magnetic field is sensitive to that. So this is actually a really interesting thing because it means that if we can look at the magnetic field in the past, we can actually learn something about what was happening in the deep Earth's um, interior in the past. And it's, it's really about the only way we can do this uh, very far in the past. So the, the one uh, question that I'm gonna try and answer for you is, one of the predictions of these models is that when the field is very stable like this, it's typically associated in the models with a strong intensity, a very high intensity, and the converse is true if the field is more variable in direction. So just a, a reminder again, uh, this is the same picture we've seen before, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at, at two sort of uh, parts of this time scale. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this long period, almost 40 million years when the field didn't change polarity at all. And that's sometimes called the Cretaceous Quiet Zone. It's abbreviated KQZ in some of my figures. But we're gonna start by looking at this older part, the very oldest part of the seafloor. Um, in fact, even a bit older than where this, where this plot goes. So we're gonna look at some rocks that are about 180 million years old. And they're in a part of time where the, we actually call this the Jurassic Quiet Zone, because when you go out and measure the anomalies out in the, in the ocean basins, they almost disappear when you get out in the Jurassic, this, this time period. And that could be because the field is low intensity, or it could be because it's switching very rapidly or some combination of the two. So those are the two extremes. So we'll look at this one first, and then I'll show you a little bit of data from this. So this, um, this diagram uh, is just sort of a summary of what we saw in the last one. So if you simply take the number of uh, times that the polarity of the magnetic field switches in any uh, million year period, you get a reversal frequency which for today is about uh, somewhere between three and four reversals every million years. So about a 250,000 years on average between uh, between shifts in direction. I should note that the last one was about 780,000 years ago. Um, so we may, be, we may be due for one, so. 
So uh, right now the reversal frequency is about three to four per million years. Here's this uh, interval where the field didn't reverse at all for a long period of time. It's about 100 million years ago in the center. And then we're going to look at a period back here where as best we can tell from the seafloor record, which stops about here, there were about the same number of reversals as we have today. But there have been some recent studies suggesting that that may be underestimated by a factor of three or so. So maybe as many as 12 reversals per million years. All right, so we're going to look at um, intensity, recovering the intensity of, the, of uh, the magnetic field from looking at rocks. And so maybe I'll have to play that one again. But uh, just to uh, give you a little primer about how this, how this works in igneous rocks, um, what happens is, maybe I can, I'll just go back. Um, what happens in igneous rocks is the, the rocks are extruded at the surface um, at very high temperatures, something on the order of 1,000 to 1,200 degrees Celsius. And as they cool, uh, the rock crystallizes and forms minerals. And then those magnetic minerals actually uh, become magnetic only when the temperature gets down to about 600 degrees or below. And then ultimately the magnetic moments or the, the cooperating spins, magnetic spins in those magnetic minerals becomes fixed um, at some lower temperature. And that's, that's the way the, uh, the signal becomes locked in in these igneous rocks. And so that's actually a, a useful thing because it's a, it's a process of magnetization that we can, we can come pretty close to replicating in the lab. We usually don't uh, heat our samples up to the point where we melt them. That would not be, uh, not be good. Uh, but instead, we can heat them up um, to uh, increasing temperatures, and then we can try and reproduce the cooling that they saw originally in nature. So in principle, it's really, it's not a hard thing to figure out what the ancient field intensity was. And the way you would do it is you just simply take a sample, you measure its magnetization, so how strong that is in the rock, and then we heat it up in a series of temperatures, and at each temperature step, we cool it in zero field. So we're basically wiping out part of that signal at each temperature step until ultimately we've gotten rid of all of it, okay? And then we could do the same experiment again, and we could heat up the samples to similar temperatures, but this time we cool it in a known field in the lab. And so now what we'd be doing is we're acquiring a remnant in a field that we know about because we imposed it in the lab. And so in the simplest case, what you can do is basically take the ratio of this final magnetization and this one, and knowing how strong the field that you applied in the lab was, you can figure out what the ancient field intensity is. Well, that's simple in principle, but it actually turns out to be very difficult to do in practice because it requires really fine magnetic particles. And by fine, I mean mostly submicron, so less than a, a millionth of a, of a meter. And not only do they have to be really fine particles, they need to be particles that you can have in a sample that you can heat up over and over again in the lab and have it not alter. And that's, uh, things like that in nature are actually fairly sparse. So this is uh, sort of what's known uh, right now about field intensity variations. And I'll point out this top figure is one we've seen before. That's just the reversal frequency. And so if we look back here in this time period about 180 million years ago, um, in theory, you'd think that someone would have gone and tested this idea before. Was the field low or high in intensity? And here's uh, some data. And you can see each of these numbers here are the number of lava flows typically that have been sampled. And they're just not very many of them. And they're pretty scattered. So <laughs> you'd have a hard time making uh, much in the way of conclusions from this. And in fact, there's only a few thousand uh, good estimates of the field intensity through all of geologic history. And about half of those are in the last few hundred thousand years or so. So it's a it's really difficult thing to, to try and measure. And so what we want are we want some rocks that are the right age to test this, and we want, we want them that have uh, the right kind of material. And so we selected this, uh, this beautiful place in Antarctica, so a nice place to visit just for the scenery, uh, but also very good for, uh, for the magnetic field. So why did, we, why did we go there? So the, the 
Dufek intrusion, and again an intrusion is an igneous rock that cooled underground, um, and this one is actually a very big intrusion. It's located, uh, it's part of the Transantarctic Mountains, uh, out in a place of, called the Pensacola Mountains. Here's a little blow up of that. And there's actually two mountain ranges that are exposed through the ice and snow. There's this one that we worked on called the Dufek, and then about 40 kilometers away there's another range that sort of pokes out of the ice and snow. And here's a picture down the bottom. So it's, we don't know exactly how big this intrusion is, but it's, it's enormous. So the smallest estimate is about 6,600 square kilometers. Um, the biggest estimate is about uh, an order of magnitude bigger than that. So a good fraction of the size of San Diego County. And the thickness of this would be, it's anywhere between about four kilometers and nine kilometers thick. So a huge amount of uh, igneous material. So it happens to be the right age. So it's 182 million years when we think the field was switching fairly frequently and may have had low intensity. That's what we're gonna try and test. Um, the other reason we selected this was because there was some preliminary work there in the, in the 70s. Um, sort of a reconnaissance study where they went around and collected samples and they actually found that we have both uh, normal polarity shown by these black dots here and reverse polarity shown by the open circles. So both directions of magnetization um, throughout, uh, this is the Dufek Massif. Notice the scale here is a couple of kilometers. And then this is the presumed continuation over in the forestal range. So we have both normal and reverse polarity. And then the thing that really uh, drew us to these rocks were that we know because of the type of rock and, um, and the conditions under which they solidified that these rocks have magnetic particles and they're very fine magnetic particles and they're sort of hidden inside the other crystals in the rock. So this is a, a thin section of a, one of these rocks and you can see this sort of yellow color here is a kind of mineral, it's called a, a pyroxene. And if you look very carefully, you can see these, these small dark lines. There's a couple of sets of them. And those are some of the magnetite particles that are a good size to uh, record the magnetic field. And even better, because they're sitting inside of these other minerals, they're actually quite stable to heating in the lab. So another sort of practical consideration is that we, we like Antarctica because there's no lightning there. And believe it or not, lightning is actually a huge problem when you try and go sample in most places in the world. And it also has, there's very little surface alteration. Um, so Antarctica is a, is a good place to go do this study. So, so how do you get uh, to Antarctica? So a little touristy, a uh, few touristy photos. Uh, so we started in uh, Christchurch, and then uh, now they actually take, um, take jets down to, uh, to McMurdo Station, which is the largest uh, US base in Antarctica. And here's what it looked like a few years ago. And here's what it looked like back in, uh, in 1910 when Scott was first in the, in the area. So we spent uh, about a week or so at McMurdo. Um, that's the place where you go to collect all the gear you need to go out in the field. And we had, we were actually plane camping, which is a good way to, uh, good way to go. We had about 12,000 pounds of gear. Um, and so the next step was to uh, fly that out to uh, this remote place that's, uh, that's quite a ways from the South Pole. We flew through the South Pole Station. Um, again, another plane ride, and uh, this, this year was, uh, was, I guess, the first year that the, the new base at the South Pole is open, and I, I just couldn't resist this one. This was, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what they're doing in the lab there, but, uh, yeah. And then uh, on to our field area itself, um, using uh, DC-3. This uh, particular one that we were in was built in 1942. Still seemed to be in really good shape. They take out all the seats, and, um, and so you can drive a snowmobile up into the, into the uh, inside of the plane. So in this figure, you can see this was, uh, we had a couple of plane trips to get all our stuff in, and this is right after the first one. You can tell, because this, uh, this is our toilet there, before a tent was built around it. <laughs> so. All right, so here's, uh, here's a close-up of, uh, of some of the rocks that I'll tell you about. Um, the, the 
rocks here, this is about, about 12 to 1,500 meters um, of exposure of rocks. And all we did was we sampled the bottom 400 meters or so is where I'm going to show you uh, data from. Um, but actually, we've been quite busy with just those. So, but I'd love to go back and uh, we'll look at the rest of this. So the, the rocks here again, and uh, I brought some, uh, some show and tell samples uh, to illustrate some of this layering. We typically associate layering in rocks uh, with sediments. And in fact, when the first people visited the Dufek Massif um, or intrusion, they flew by and they thought, oh, these must be all sediments because you can see this beautiful layering in them. But in this case, the layering is actually on a variety of scales is from being in a magma chamber, a large magma chamber. And the color changes here are basically just different uh, proportions of basically three different minerals, one white one and a couple of brown ones. And so that's what uh, you can have a look at in some of the samples I brought. So some of those layers are very fine and some of them are really big. Like this is one uh, that we've seen in some of the previous photos from far away. This brown layer here is actually about 10 meters thick, and it's made of uh, basically just one mineral, one of those uh, dark colored minerals. And if you look closely, you can actually see the little sparkles of light in there are actually the size of the individual crystals. Some of them are about the size of your fist, um, maybe a bit bigger. And this kind of layer we can actually trace for about 40 kilometers or so along, along the mountain range. So we know just, just where we are. So, we were out there trying to sample. We want our samples to be oriented. So we were fortunate. This is our mountaineer, Brian. Um, and Brian had not been to Antarctica before, but uh, it turned out he loved to drill rocks. Um, <laughs> and so he, he, did, he did much of the drilling for us. And uh, we would come behind and collect the oriented cores. So this uh, instrument sticking in the rock there is before we've broken the core out. We actually orient it and put a mark on there. Um, trying to get uh, measurement from the sun as well as from a magnetic compass. And then I just wanted to, I couldn't resist this one either. So by the end of the field season, Brian was, uh, he, was he was trying his hardest to try and drill things that we couldn't orient. So, uh, so this, this is actually pretty much a vertical face. And you can see the ropes coming down. So Brian hung on the ropes and drilled those holes. And then, uh, then we had to climb up and, uh, and grab them all. So he was very enthusiastic. <laughs> and we ended up with about 800 cores, um, which translates into about 4,000 rocks we can work on. And we've, uh, we've measured the directions by heating them up in the lab. And we've also determined intensities. Um, so the first question is, did we find the same two polarities, normal and reverse? And the answer is yes. Um, these diagrams, I don't want to, to uh, worry about too much. Uh, this is just a way to represent the three-dimensional magnetization vector in a sample as we start cooking it at higher and higher temperatures. But all you really need to know, I've put these colored arrows on here, so the, they're on the vertical part of that uh, magnetic direction. So this one that's pointing up, that's a normal polarity. And this one pointing down is reverse polarity. So that's good. We found some of those. But what was more interesting is that we actually find a lot of samples like these, which have, again, the same kind of plot. So at their highest temperature, when they were cooling, they actually acquired a reverse component of magnetization. And then the field switched directions, and it was normal. And then it was reverse again. So during cooling, these, these rocks and individual samples saw just a long history of uh, cooling that records these different magnetic events. So here's a, a little summary diagram. Um, how many polarity uh, reversals are there in the, in the DUFEC? Um, we don't know exactly, but there are lots. So here's about 400 meters of section. And these green dots, that's the highest temperature component. If they're over on this side, that's normal polarity. Over here is reversed. And you can see there's some jumping around back and forth. Uh, here's an intermediate temperature component and then some low temperature components. And this is only 400 meters of section, so there's another, at least another three kilometers uh, of stuff above us that we haven't sampled. So we were also successful. These turned out to be really nice rocks to get intensities. And again, we'll not worry about the details here of how, how we did these measurements, but 
The two colors of green and of red there are just two different techniques of determining the ancient field intensity. And you can see that we were pretty successful. We got about, uh, about 300 estimates of the field intensity overall. And what's even nicer is that you can see that there's some serial correlations between those. So we think this is, uh, first, it's a very large number of uh, intensity variations. And what's even better is we can sort of put them in some time order. Um, so here's um, just a summary of what those intensities are. So we have lots of field reversals. Um, and it turn, turns out we get very low field intensities, sort of just as, as uh, models, the dynamo models have predicted. So the green here, the histogram here, is from the highest temperature component. And the average is about 14 microteslas. So today's fields um, at the location where the DUFEC is, um, that's about a third of the value that you would find today. So very low values and significantly, I think, even lots of values down here at very low levels that are sort of comparable to the intensity of the field now when it goes through either a reversal or the field strays off into an odd direction. And then we have another set of uh, intensity estimates a little bit higher from a lower temperature component. Those would have been acquired a little bit later in time. So another set of estimates there. So we have low intensities, lots of reversals, and in fact, um, I kind of like to think of this as uh, it was a weak and maybe even a fibrillating uh, field in the, in the Jurassic, so about 180 million years ago. So we have thermal models that tell us a little bit about how long this cooling took, but estimates are probably 100,000 years to, uh, to maybe as much as a million years for the, the 400 meters that we sample. Okay, so. In the, in the few minutes uh, remaining here, I wanted to, to uh, jump out to a seagoing project and um, get away from Antarctica. So this is a nice picture of, uh, of the Ravel um, off, off of Antarctica. And if you recall, um, early in the talk, I showed you a picture, a little cartoon of how the seafloor is generated. And I said, well, we have lavas coming out, and they're cooling down, and they're um, acquiring the ambient field direction. And that's what we see in these magnetic anomalies that we measure at the sea surface. Um, so you might think if they record the direction very well, which they do, then you could also get intensity information out of the, out of the magnetic field variations at, at the sea surface. And, and I believe we made some progress in doing this. Um, I wanted to show you first an example um, from a time period about 10 million years ago. So on the bottom right here, this is a distance of about 50 kilometers. Here's a scale for these wiggles. So these are the variations in the intensity of the magnetization, or of the magnetic field. And you can see on the top here where it's, it's colored in gray. So this is all one polarity. And within that polarity interval, you can see there's these nice smaller wavelength features. And you can see they just line up beautifully across all those profiles over many, many kilometers. And this type of information, this is from the sea surface. If you, if you then, here's the same uh, or related uh, profile at the sea surface. And then if you put a magnetometer near the sea floor, you actually get more high frequency variations in the, in the magnetization of the, of the rocks and the magnetic field. Uh, but you'll see that those also correlate pretty well over, again, tens of kilometers. And what we think this is, is that this is a very direct measure of the intensity of the field. So the direction is staying more or less constant, and it's the intensity that's going up and down. So this is an example from about 10 million years ago. And the question that we asked of a few years ago um, was whether this extreme interval in the Cretaceous about 100 million years ago does this have that same kind of variability um, that we see in younger parts of the time scale? And if it, if it didn't, that would be very surprising. Um, but it would tell us something uh, fundamental about the field. So here's a, a sort of representative profile of a part of that long interval where the field didn't reverse. So on the bottom here, you see the topography of the seafloor. So this is uh, about 1,000 kilometers or so. At the very end here, you'll see it's labeled 34Y. 
That's the end, the young end of this constant polarity interval at about 80, 84 million years ago. And so all of this material, this is the anomaly or the magnetic field variations, all of these wiggles in here are not related to changes in the direction of the field. So, so what's, what's causing those? And in fact, they're almost as big as when the field does change directions. So this is actually one indication that we think the field intensity may have been, may have been quite high during this interval. So if you want to go study this, it turns out a good place, probably the best place to do it is in the South Pacific, uh, in a place that's really remote. And if we want to investigate this, we need to know what the seafloor looks like, and we need to have lots and lots of profiles to see whether these variations line up from one profile to the next. And that's, that's a tough order, particularly this last one. So uh, we tried something new, and that was uh, to fly little airplanes off of the ship. So this is a picture of a little, uh, little airplane, and it has a magnetometer, very much like the one we tow behind the ship in the nose there. And this is launched from the, from the ship, and this shows, us, shows you what we're trying to do. So basically, we need the information of the seafloor topography, so the ship in black here will collect that kind of information in these light blue areas. And then while the ship is doing that, we can send the plane up and we can actually get about three times as much data by flying these little planes around. So that's the idea. And let's see if this works. <laughs> so, so, short one without any sound. So this is a little, uh, it's a uh, catapult system, so you start up the engine and then this is catapulted up, and the planes would go, um, would fly for up to about 16 hours collecting data, and then you of course have to get them back. Um, and, and I'll tell you, we weren't successful in all cases. We lost, we lost two and a half planes when we were doing this. So, um, so the way we get them back is, uh, is the plane flies in, and it has little clips on the end of the wing. And it catches, so it's doing a differential GPS. There's a GPS receiver here and then one on top of the boom. Um, this is not technology that we invented. This is actually, these planes are run by uh, Fugro. Um, but it does differential GPS and just flies in and clips, uh, clips onto the rope there. So just to show you, I said we, we lost some planes, so we didn't get as much data as we'd hoped. Um, but we did get quite a bit of data from the planes, and I just wanted to show you an example. This is work that's still in progress. Um, so the, the colored background here, this is the seafloor topography, and you can see these nice um, abyssal hills, so small hills that show you the direction of spreading. And then all the colored lines here, those are anomaly, magnetic anomaly profiles. The colored ones, the brightly colored ones here are from the plane, shown from these sections up here. And then the, the longer ones are from, uh, from the ship toad magnetometer. And they agree this produced you know, just wonderful data. And I guess at this point what I would say is we've, we definitely have some areas in this long uh, interval of constant polarity where you have things that you can correlate from one line to another. But there are lots of other places, sometimes uh, disturbed by little uh, later volcanoes where things don't look so good. Uh, but our best guess right now is that we think we really do have what I would call quasi-linear anomalies in, the, in this Cretaceous period. And another interesting thing is that it appears that the, the signals are big enough that we really do need uh, some very high magnetizations because this seafloor is down about five kilometers depth. So, so that again would be consistent, generally consistent with those models. So I'll just leave you, I, I probably best uh, if the text wasn't on there so you can see the nice picture of, uh, this is about sunset, uh, so this is about uh, uh, early February, so when the sun is about to go down for the final time in Antarctica. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, we can learn some things by looking at these variations in the magnetic field, the direction and the intensity, and they can tell us uh, some really uh, interesting things about what's happening in the interior of the Earth. And at least for now, I'd say the, to first order, both what we see in the samples um, and what we see at sea are pretty much consistent with these uh, ideas that are coming out of the geodynamo models, that we have high intensity when we have low field variability and the converse. So I'll leave it there.
Thank you. So the question was whether there are external events that could influence uh, what the magnetic field is doing, and there have been lots of suggestions to that effect. I mean, asteroids uh, have been one. In particular, if you look at the, um, these long periods where the field didn't change in direction, that coincides with a lot of uh, sort of major events in Earth history. So big uh, amounts of igneous material coming up from deep in the mantle. Um, so there's all sorts of geochemical signals that people have tried to link with that. But the, yeah, the, the causal relationships are, are more difficult to, uh, to pull out, I'd say. Yes, uh, so the question was, yeah, what happens uh, when the shielding goes away? Um, so, so right now, if, if you ask me, I would say now, today's field is probably higher than it's been on average in the past, so we're, we're in good shape. It's decreasing very rapidly right now. Um, and if it were to go away completely, then yes, we would, we would have lots of, uh, I would guess we'd have lots of more incidences of uh, skin cancer and uh, um, so there would be radiation problems. Um, there, there have been, though, um, lots of periods in the past. The most recent one is maybe about 40,000 years ago. We think the field intensity was probably 10% of what it is today. Um, and those people have looked to see if there's um, any systematic change in the kinds of, uh, did, did lots of animals uh, die off, for example, when that happens? And, and the answer to that seems to be no. That, uh, there's no correlation that can be found so far yet with, uh, with disappearance of that. Uh, what other institutions do I work with? Um, the, uh, this project in Antarctica is actually working closely with uh, people at University of Wyoming, which is, uh, they have a great t-shirt there that uh, has them as an oceanographic institution. You know, if sea level goes up uh, 7,000 7, feet, so. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, There's, um, I would say, the, the magnetic community. We've worked uh, with some people in, in Paris. They have groups that do similar sorts of work, particularly towing magnetometers near the sea floor. Um, there's, a, there's a pretty small community of people who do this in the US. I'd say Woods Hole and, and Scripps and, and a few others. Yeah. yeah, so the question is whether the magnetic field has anything to do with sustainability or maybe um, sort of climate issues. Yeah. And I'll tell you that people in our field, there have been a few papers recently um, trying to, to suggest that the magnetic fields uh, might be related to, for example, changes in the amount of the way uh, CO2 dissolves in seawater or um, or to changes in orbital parameters for the Earth. And uh, my personal opinion is that those are, uh, those are pretty speculative, and, uh, uh, but people keep searching for them because it would be, it would be a, a boon, I would say, to, uh, <laughs> to magnetics research. So, uh, yeah, so the question is, um, did we do any corrections for the topography of the seafloor when we looked at magnetic anomalies? The answer is, is yes, we, we did. Um, uh, but to first order, uh, the signal that you get simply from the topography is, uh, is very, very small, probably less than 5% of the, that overall signal. But the, uh, so the question is, yeah, are these kinds of studies done uh, sort of looking at human origins or uh, things like that? And the answer is, um, so intensity, measuring intensity variations in the magnetic field is actually one way that we try and do uh, chronologies for some archeological sites. So the, the trick there is that you, you need to build up a local, uh, local reference curve of things that are very well dated. And then once you have that, you can actually use the intensity and better yet, if you can get intensity and direction, that's even a more unique um, way to date things. Yeah, the question is, does reversal of the field direction imply a reversal of the, of the convection patterns in the outer core? Um, at, at some level, yes, but it's a very, yeah, the, the direction of uh, flow in the outer core, right where it meets the, the overlying mantle, is in a different direction than near the inner core. Um, what we can see most readily, you can actually solve, I, I can't, but um, people more clever than me can uh, actually solve for the motion, the fluid motion at the very outer part of the core by looking at, um, sort of historical scale changes in the magnetic field. So which way the flux lines appear to be drifting at the surface is related directly to that flow at the, at the, 
at the outer core boundary. Um, what happens yeah, deep, if you integrate through the core, I guess I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that, whether that it's a one-for-one -one swap in direction, I, I doubt it. But, yeah. Um, yeah, the question is whether we ever use big magnets. Um, in, in our field, we, we really don't like big magnets. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, big magnets, so what happens is, um, is the bigger magnetic particles in the rocks um, are susceptible to relatively low fields, much bigger than the Earth's field, but still low. If, if you have a permanent, uh, your refrigerator magnet would do, would do lots of damage to, uh, to, to most rocks. So we discourage their use, right? Yeah, no, that's a, a good question. So how does, it's too hot to, uh, for iron to be magnetic, and so what makes, the, what makes the magnetic field in the outer core? And the answer is really that, that iron um, is a, an electrical conductor. And so what you need to make a dynamo is essentially you need um, a molten uh, electrical conductor. In, in the case of the Earth, it's molten iron primarily. Um, you need to have a rotating body to keep the, the helical cir circulation cells aligned. Um, and then you need something to stir up the liquid. And that could either be uh, a thermal convection, it could be uh, compositional, something that stirs up and causes the fluid to convect. And then that's, that's, basically, that's basically all you need to get a... So you get electrically conducting things that are moving, so whenever they're moving, they generate a magnetic field. And the way the flux lines um, interact, they actually are there so, such that they sustain and generate, um, generate the, the field. So if the, if the circulation in the outer core were to stop, the magnetic field would still be here for a while, but it'd be here for about 20,000 years or so. That's, uh, that's how long it would take to decay away. So, yeah, why is the solid core there? Is it just a pressure effect? Well, the solid inner core is basically the same compositionally as, as the outer core with some minor differences. And it's basically just crystallized out from, from the liquid. So one of the interesting questions that uh, people in our field have looked at is, um, could you tell if you went to look at very old rocks, is the magnetic field different when we had uh, a smaller inner core or if we had no inner core? Um, so that's one of the things that actually some of the rocks that are over on the table are when we were trying to do that on some almost three billion year old rocks. But uh, yeah, so the question is, is the, is the inner core growing and what, you know, what's the implication of that? And the implication is at some point the inner core will be, or the uh, outer liquid core will solidify and then we're, we're done in terms of magnetics, but that's, that's, a ways, that's a ways out. So that's essentially what we think may have happened, for example, in, the, in, in Mars or in the moon. Things with smaller cores um, may have had a field in the past, but now, now they don't anymore. Yeah, so the question is, you know, what, what kind of environment do we have in our lab? And I guess I should have mentioned that. So our, our lab down the hill is basically we have a, a shielded room. You build a, a, a box out of transformer steel and we magnetize that so that it cancels out the Earth's field. So we're working in, in essentially zero field. And then we have more shields inside of that that are even closer to, you know, we get down to sort of 10 parts out of 50,000 for the, for the field intensity. Um, what's the current uh, magnetic deviation here? The current uh, deviation is a little over 12 degrees, and the uh, and the magnetic pole is off to the is off to the east of us. So so plus 12.2, I think it is. Yeah. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for a wonderful. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you.